organized by World Scientific Publishing. So moving on to the next slide. Now for a few housekeeping notes before we start. You are most welcome to leave your camera on, but please keep the mics muted while the forum is ongoing. There will be a Q&A session after the talk, so please feel free to post your questions to any of the special guests in the chat at any time. After posting your question in the chat, you may be invited to unmute and read it out during the Q&A session if you are comfortable in doing so. Also, this webinar will be recorded and posted online. Moving on to the next slide. So today we are honored to welcome Kishore Mabubani, Dr. Henry Weiyao Wang, and Professor Wang Yiwei, three of the most notable voices regarding global affairs of China in the modern era, here today as our special guests. Today's discussion will be centered on the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative, known within China as the One Belt, One Road, a global infra infrastructure development strategy adopted by the Chinese government in 2013 to invest in more than 150 countries and international organizations. And Kishore Mababani, Dr. Henry Weiyao Wang, and Professor Wang Yiwei will be providing their expertise on the subject and will be offering their assessment today for our global audience. So Kishore Mababani is a distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute, National University of Singapore, and has enjoyed two distinct careers, one in diplomacy, having had a 33 year old diplomatic career at the Singaporean Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 1971 to 2004, and one in academia, having been appointed as the founding dean of the Lei Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Moving on to the next slide. Dr. Henry Weiyao Wang is the founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization, the leading independent global think tank in China. He is also the vice chairman of China Association for International Economic Cooperation, Association of the Ministry of Commerce, director of MFA's Chinese People's Institute of Foreign Affairs, and the dean of Institute of Development Studies of China Southwestern University of Finance. Moving on to the next slide. So Professor Wang Yiwei is a professor of the School of International Relations at the Renmin University of China. Within Renmin University, Professor Yiwei plays multiple roles as a director of the Institute of International Affairs, the director of the Center of European Studies, and also as a Jean Monet chair professor at the university. Now we are also pleased to welcome back our familiar panel of experienced co-moderators. Moving on to the next slide. The first is Professor Dashuan Feng, Honorary Dean of Henan University Belt and Road Research Institute and the Chief Advisor of China Silk Road I Valley Research Institute. Moving on to the next slide. Then lastly, joining us as well as co-moderator is Dr. Joanna Lei, who is a chairperson of the National Women's League, Senator and appointed chairman of a Taiwan government owned enterprise KKL and owns and holds many corporate board positions in Taiwan and chairs the board of a Hong Kong listed company. Now, without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Joanna Lei to kick off the discussion. All right, thank you, Jasmine. A while back when Dasha and I talked about um, holding a meeting on Build and Road Initiative on its anniversary, we came up with a dream list and we're so delighted that all members on the dream list and of course Dasha himself included, have decided to join this particular panel and I am so honored to co-host this panel discussion commemorating the 10th anniversary of the Build and Road Initiative. Um, let me share, also share with you just two different maps and I think they're very useful maps. Um, can you see the first map? This is what I saw recently in um, a discussion on the Hamburg um, investment for China. And the second map is what the Build and Road Initiative is represented to the English media in many of the places. The difference between the first map and the second map is a notable um, missing part of Nairobi. And I think that really tells us in, a man, in many ways what this really is about. That is, Build and Road Initiative has a very large focus on the world as we knew it and as it's defined by um, the traditional powers, but it also has a very strong implication for the- Go oh, ahead, I cannot, I cannot see the map. Okay, well, let me, um, let me try to get back to where I am. And I'm um, sorry, because we actually exercised and tried it just now. Okay, let me um, try again. 
Let's see. Now, can you all see the map? No. If not, let, let, no. Me, let me get out of the map and then we'll just talk about it. So that we don't waste too much time because I want to leave as much time to our speakers. I think yes. in the um, traditional yeah. Western point of view, the world connects Europe through Asia with the big land bridge and the Hamburg map expressed just that. But the second map has a large part connecting to Europe. So this new land bridge from Asia through Central Asia, South Asia, all the way through Europe and Africa is the Belt and Road Initiative official map. With that, let me make three observations about the last 10 years since its proposal. First of all, Geopolitical forces driven and led by the United States have ushered in a new military alliance, advanced military joint exercises, and of course, one major European war between Russia and Ukraine. All of these negatively affected the economic outlook of the world and also especially the economic outlook of European Union and NATO countries to say the least. Secondly, the United States has an increasing hostility toward the United States, toward China, from Obama to Trump to Biden administrations. Initially, it was a repivot to Asia, and now China is being viewed and termed as, in quote, a pacing threat, end quote, to the United States. With that, the U.S. has adopted various means of engagement to compete with PRC, from trade tariffs to trade sanctions, to technology and investment restrictions and so on and so forth. Unlike what Yellen defined as um, measures of de-risking, these measures are broad-based, not narrow, pervasive, not, ta not targeted, and they cover from Huawei to BRD to Ningde Shidai, from US listed companies to US financial investments. And sometimes, once in a while, you have a very honest person stating that these specific rules for PRC is designed for national security reasons, and they are intended to strip China of its competitiveness in the frontier of science and technology development. And thirdly, in the interim, the world is in a terrible shape, and we human beings are facing imminent threats of survival in multiple fronts from COVID-19 to natural disasters everywhere. For example, in US alone, since 2020, <coughs> 2022, climate and weather related natural disasters have averaged 151 billion US dollars per year based on Peter Peterson's calculation, that's a foundation, a 57 increase from the prior decade and almost five times the cost of the 1990s. We humans, have not achieved goals set by COP26, nor have we advanced in UN's sustainable development goals in any tangible and meaningful ways. It is against these backdrops that we're here today to discuss the Build and Road Initiative. It's an, an alternative geoeconomic framework led by the PRC, which many of the West still consider as a debt trap to the detriment of the global South. However, is it another globalization attempt as in the colonial years or the post-World War II era that benefits the strong and strips, deprives the weak? Or can the BRI deliver the promises of developing core infrastructure and market economy in the global South, resolving poverty and other calamities through economic development and achieving the ultimate change in the distribution of values which are fair and equitable to resource exporting and manufacturing countries? These are questions to be answered. Let me bring the discussion a little closer to home. In 2022, suddenly to us, and all of a sudden out of the blue, Taiwan is earmarked as the flashpoint, a most dangerous place on earth. Recently with RCEP and BRI steaming ahead, other powers led by the United States and Western media, politicians and academic touting Ukraine today, Taiwan tomorrow. 
the U.S. insisted on having TSMC build a lab in Phoenix for security reasons. Quad, AUKUS, began one after another joint military exercise in our neck of the woods. Recently, the Red Flag 23 just concluded a few days ago, and the large-scale exercise 2023 all had our region, and especially PRC, as a potential um, party in the opposite side of the United States. In considering these, as we're speaking, we're asking why Ukraine today and Taiwan tomorrow? In the beginning, people in Taiwan shrugged it off, saying that this is not possible. But when DPP officials reiterated many of the US positions towards PRC, and the next presidential candidate, Lai Qingde, just made a few statements in the United States saying that Taiwan must build up its deterrence military force, then the war doesn't seem to be so far away. Why people were concerned initially? Because the last real battle ended on October 5th, 1958, some 65 years ago across Taiwan Straits. 65 years without a war. So because we were able to resolve our differences across Taiwan Straits with, without international intervention or military involvement for those long time, and because we have already traveled down a path of peaceful co-development in the not so distant past. Starting from 2005, Lian Zhan and Hu Jintao met in Beijing. They ushered in a period when KMT and CCP established two forums focusing on peace and economic development respectively. When KMT won the 2008 general election, the then president Ma Ying-jeou took the baton to the next level. During 2008 and 16, the two governments held 11 high level meetings between agencies and signed 23 official agreements covering mutual legal, legal assistance, financial supervision, trade, investment, taxation, IPR, flight route, food and produce safety, among others. These were achieved on the basis of the 1992 consensus, a principle that Tsai Ing-wen refused to recognize and Lai Qingde rejected flat out. So let me conclude with three questions. If we have a real shot for peace, why must we go to war? If we could deal with each other peacefully, why do we need foreign intervention? especially one that carries its own agenda. And if we have an opportunity to bring all countries, especially those that are lagging behind into prosperity, how can we allow any force pushing us humans into the bottomless pit of death and destruction? With these questions concerning war and peace, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, one of the most articulate and insightful voices of our time, Kishore Mabubani. Ladies and gentlemen, Kishore. Uh, thank you, thank you, Joanna. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Let me begin with just, if you don't mind, before I turn to BRI, uh, two small, uh, maybe technical points. Number one, I hope that everyone who's listening in uh, will be muting their microphones because unfortunately your, your presentation, Joanna, uh, was interrupted by people whose microphones were not muted. I hope they will now mute them. And the second point is that even though I think we're not supposed to discuss uh, at some depth uh, whether or not Taiwan will be the next Ukraine, uh, I want to say that you issued a, a very good a word of warning uh, to your fellow Taiwanese, because uh, Taiwan can be the next Ukraine. And I think it's important for every Taiwanese to realize that unless the Taiwanese people are very, very careful, they'll be dragged into a war that they do not want. And I think it's very important that you issue uh, that warning. 
And the reason why that might happen is that there are lots of falsehoods traveling in the world. And indeed, in my remarks today on the Belt and Road Initiative, the key message I want to put across is that, you know, many people in Taiwan and in the rest of the world trust the Western media. And they say the Western media believes in the highest ideals, the highest values. They only search for the truth. They're only objective. They're only impartial. They never tell lies. And yet, the Western media has created one of the biggest lies of the 21st century. And what is this big lie I'm talking about? This is the gap between the narrative that the Western media puts out on the Belt and Road Initiative and anybody who reads the Western media on the Belt and Road Initiative, you just ask them a simple question. What does BRI stand for? And as you said in your remarks, Joanna, oh, it stands for debt trap diplomacy. <laughs> and the fact, the reality, and that's the narrative. Western media puts it out all the time. But the reality is that the Belt and Road Initiative has helped millions of people around the world. Millions. But the Western media cannot and will not describe it. So what I propose to do today is to try to explain how you have this incredible gap between the reality of what the BRI has done and the story that the Western media puts out. And the reason why the Western media story is completely wrong is because it is based on three false assumptions. You must dig out the assumptions below the stories to find out what went wrong. So the first false assumption is that Western aid sets the gold standard for all aid. Because Western aid is given without any political motives, only to help other people, is not self-interested, only does good, does no evil. And by contrast, the BRI doesn't live up to the gold standard. Now, that's the first false assumption. The second false assumption is that all the people in the third world, the 88% of the world's population who live outside the West, they are stupid. Only the West is intelligent. Only the West is smart enough to avoid that threat diplomacy. The people in the third world are so stupid. They get sucked into debt trap diplomacy. They have no brains, right? That's the second false assumption. And the third false assumption is that the BRI has done no good anywhere in the world. I mean, it's shocking that these are the assumptions on which the Western narrative is based on. And now let me systematically dissect these three assumptions to explain why they're completely wrong. Now, the first assumption that Western aid sets the gold standard for aid is a complete myth, complete myth. Western aid, like any other country's aid, is self-interested and is never designed to help other countries, but to help the national interests of the countries that are giving it. And if you have any doubts about this, fortunately, I published a book actually about 10 years ago, around the time when the Belt and Road Initiative was launched. It's called The Great Convergence. And I have an entire chapter that points out 
how remarkably bad the Western aid story has been. And let me just read to you uh, uh, just one or two paragraphs in this book. The first paragraph, this is what I say. My rough estimate is that for every one dollar given out in foreign aid by the West, particularly bilateral aid, technical assistance, conditional aid, economic food aid, military aid, 20 cents of that one dollar gets spent on the administrative expenses of the donor country, paying for salaries of their own officials. 20 cents goes to consultants employed by the donor country, and the consultants are, of course, Western citizens. 30 to 40 cents goes to procuring equipment or services provided by the donor country to help the industries of the donor country. And if the recipient country is lucky, it will actually get 20 to 30 cents out of, out of every foreign aid dollar uh, that was ostensibly given to the country. And I conclude the paragraph by saying, I would like to challenge the development experts in the OECD and the World Bank to provide an alternative estimate if they believe that my estimate is wrong. Guess what? 10 years have passed and no one has challenged this estimate. But I can tell you, even my estimate that 20 cents of every Western aid reaches the recipient, that is maybe too generous. Because on the same page, on page uh, 205, I tell a story, and this is actually documented by a famous uh, writer, Claire Lockhart. And this is, again, in my book, I say, a villager in Afghanistan told Claire Lockhart, open quotes, we would like to tell you the story of $150 million of Western aid going up in smoke. We heard on the radio that there was going to be a reconstruction program in our region to help rebuild our houses after coming back from exile, and we were very pleased, right? They were supposed to, this Afghan was supposed to get $150 million. But what happened to the $150 million? This is what happened, let me tell you. After many months, very, very little had happened, and this young Afghan says, we may be illiterate, but we're not super stupid. So we went to find out what was going on. And this is what we discovered. When the $150 million was received by an agency in Geneva, they took 20% and subcontracted the job to another agency in Washington, D.C., who also took another 20%. Again, it was subcontracted with another 20% was taken. And this happened again when the money arrived in Kabul. 20% to agency in Geneva, 20% to Washington DC agency, 20% to consultants in Kabul. By that time, there was very little money left. But enough for someone to buy wood in Western Iran and have it shipped by a shipping cartel owned by a provincial, provincial governor at five times the cost of regular transportation. Eventually, some wooden beams reached our village, but the beams were too large and heavy for the mud walls that we can build. So all we could do was chop them up and use them for firewood. Now, this is a very powerful story of how $150 million of aid goes up in smoke. And that's supposed to be the Western gold standard. So the first thing we must attack is the flawed assumption of the Western gold standard. The second false assumption is that, oh, we in the third world, we are so stupid. We don't know what's good for us, right? And what is shocking is that the Western media keeps reporting this debt trap diplomacy, debt trap diplomacy, debt trap diplomacy, even though very eminent Western academics have published detailed articles refuting it. And one of them is a very brave academic at the John Hopkins University. Her name is Deborah Brautigam, B-R-A-U-T-I-G-A-M. Now, you know, what is interesting is that before uh, coming on this program, I did some research and I read the Wikipedia entry on Deborah Brautigam. Now there's one paragraph in that Wikipedia 
which should be spread around the world. And this is the paragraph in the Wikipedia page of Deborah Brothigan. And it explains debt trap diplomacy brilliantly. This is what the paragraph says. In December 2021, BBC, oh, the world's best radio station, very objective. BBC contacted Brothigan to give a brief explanation of debt trap diplomacy, an example of it, and why the evidence doesn't support it. The morning after, a BBC broadcast recording used clips of the brief interview with Brotigam and misrepresented her position on the debt threat issue, discarding all the evidence she brought forth that the conventional wisdom was not correct. Right? Brotigam contacted the BBC reporter that reached out to her who said that this was an editing decision by an inexperienced producer. Now, after the BBC had deliberately distorted the views of an American academic, they should have learned a lesson that the whole story of debt trap diplomacy is a myth. But guess what? The BBC keeps using the phrase debt trap diplomacy, knowing full well it's a lie. Knowing full well it's a lie. And then every Western media uses that phrase, that threat diplomacy, even though it is a lie. And this is where I think the Western media needs to really do some very hard reflection on why it is propagating lies. And at the same time, it is also insulting the world's population. I can tell you that I and my colleagues have spoken to African experts when, and you know, one of the Africans says that Africa now spends 50% of its budget on debt servicing to IMF and Western lenders. So the debt trap diplomacy is not by China. It's by the West. Chinese debt is only 11% of total African debt. So why is it when Chinese debt is so low compared to Western debt, why don't you call Western debt debt trap diplomacy, right? That's an example of a falsehood, amazing falsehood. So this, and, and, and I can tell you that it is a terrible insult uh, to all of us, the Asians, the Africans, and Latin Americans, eh, to say that we do not know what is good for us. Because at the end of the day, when they look at the realistic alternatives that they have, many countries in the third world see that China does try to help them. And you know, the story of COVID-19 has not been fully written yet. But at the height of COVID, when third world countries wanted to buy Western vaccines, they were not available. The generous Western countries, which had surpluses of vaccines, wouldn't sell them to Africa, wouldn't sell them to Thailand, an ally of the United States, wouldn't sell them to Indonesia, a good friend. So what did Indonesia do? Indonesia got vaccines from China, right? And this is something that is not known in the West, completely unknown. So, so against this track record, how can you say that the third world countries are so stupid and do not know what they're doing? Now, the third false assumption and this one I will say a bit less because I'm reaching the end of my time. And at the same time, I'm sure that this will come out in the discussion. There is absolutely no doubt, even though the Western media says that DRI has achieved no good, that it has helped so many countries. But here, if I want to fault China on what count, one count, I think China has not done a good job of publicizing 
the positive effects of its BRI projects. It could do a lot more. I mean, for example, take a country like Uzbekistan. It used to take the people of Uzbekistan weeks to go from one side of the country to the other side of the country. But in 900 days, in a BRI project, a tunnel was built through the mountains and the people of Uzbekistan could go from one side of the country to the other side of the country in 900 seconds. Now that's a remarkable improvement in life. No mention of it anywhere. Take the Laos is one of the poorest countries in the world. Guess what? One of the poorest countries in the world, Laos, which was one of the most heavily bombed countries in the Vietnam War, Obama admitted that, now has a train faster than any train in America. <laughs> Isn't that shocking? <laughs> and then, if you look at Indonesia, I mean, Jakarta Bandung is about to uh, very soon start a fast track, fast train. They can, they, in theory, can go up to 400 kilo, 420 kilometers per hour. But this, of course, it's going to go at 350 kilometers per hour for safety reasons. Again, none of this is covered in the, in the, in the, in, in, in the Western media, right? So what, what the world therefore needs to hear is examples of concrete projects in the third world that have actually benefited so many people. And these are the stories which we must begin to tell uh, to a much wider audience. And this is why I think a forum like this is very timely, because it's only at such forum that we can expose these three major flawed assumptions of the Western media. The first is that the West sets a gold standard, not true. The second is that the people of the third world are stupid. They don't know what's good for them, not true. And the third is that the BRI hasn't helped anybody, not true. It's, it's actually shocking that you have in the 21st century a huge gap between the reality of the BRI and all the myths that have been created, the false myths that have been created by the Western media. Let's expose this fully. Thank you very much. Mm. Let me now turn over the floor to my very good friend, uh, Henry Wang. Uh, Henry Wang and I actually did a monk debate together we debated General McMaster and Michael Pillsbury in the monk debate, and we won. And equally importantly, if you look behind me, there's a book called The Asian 21st Century. Uh, it was launched by uh, Henry Wang's uh, Center for China and Globalization. Uh, the publisher, Springer, said they'd be happy if they could get 20,000 downloads of this book, Asian 21st Century. Instead, as of yesterday, there have been 3.15 million downloads. 3.15 million downloads instead of 20,000 downloads, showing that the world is psychologically preparing for the uh, uh, Asian century. So over to you, my good friend, Henry. Okay, good. Uh, uh, thank you, Keisha, and also uh, Joanna and, and uh, Dash, Dash and Fung. And uh, so uh, uh, thank you, the, the organizer, for uh, organizing this 10-year uh, uh, anniversary of uh, Belt and Road uh, uh, you know, webinar. And uh, it's really interesting to, to hear uh, uh, the introduction. Of course, uh, very exciting to hear what Keisha has just uh, eloquently spoke out. I, I think you as observer, you know, uh, outside uh, China and, and from ASEAN, you know, this really uh, shed a lot of new light uh, to the uh, to the you know the ten years development of Belt and Road, and I think you uh, break many uh, myths around the Belt and Road, and I think that is really very much uh, uh, encouraging. And uh, thank you for for the very eloquent uh, speech. Uh, what what I actually want to to to, to talk also uh, reflect a bit of. Uh, uh, Joanna's opening uh, remark is that uh, uh, you know we are getting into the world of uh, of uh, uh, you know geopolitical tensions and uh, uh, 
uh, all those uh, uh, increase the military budget and uh, arms race and, and also, you know, hot spot uh, in, in Europe, in Asia, in, in, in many parts of the world. And, uh, and then what went wrong? I mean, <laughs> that's really, I think the question, you know, in, in Russia and of course uh, uh, issues of course in the Taiwan Strait. What, what I think actually for the last uh, 70, you know, seven or 78 years of, uh, uh, you know, Second World War, we, we, we have this uh, economic globalization, if, uh, first designed by the U.S. I mean, through uh, uh, IMF, WTO, and, uh, and uh, World Bank, and all, all, the, all those international organizations. And that, at that high speed of globalization has actually come to face challenge. You know? But I think that, that globalization has actually uh, uh, transformed the world and uh, transformed uh, many developing countries and of course transformed China. And of course, all, all the Asian tigers and all uh, pattern of Japan, South Korea, and then, uh, you know, four tigers. And of course, uh, now China, and then after that, India and, and all the rest. So, so European, of course, benefited from the Marshall Plan that uh, uh, in, in the 40s and 50s. So, so what I am going to say is that the economic globalization, actually, even though there are some uh, uh, challenges, has actually uh, brought all of us uh, together to, to the prosperity we've, we've seen today. I mean, the living standards has gone up, uh, you know, dozens of times, you know, if not hundreds, and, uh, and the income has also gone up a hundred, uh, you know, uh, or if not, uh, at least for China, hundreds of times too. Uh, it's enormous, it's enormous that, that, that kind of a, uh, transformation. So, so I'm still a believer of, of more inclusive globalization. I think that's where we should really continue to pursue. So I'm worried a bit about this security, uh, militarization, and uh, and uh, you know uh, globalization trend that is driven more by the geopolitical rather than the geoeconomic or, or more economic uh, uh, boom. So, uh, so I think in that respect we see. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you can see the uh, AIB China has been proposing, of course, Belt and Road now proposed for 10 years. And now you have uh, also uh, China joined ASEP, the biggest free trade agreement in the world, and China is trying to join CPTPP, another high standard of, uh, I, I call it the mini WTO to join. And then of course we have, uh, uh, China has been active uh, engaged in the BRICS, which is going to have, a, you know, uh, together with India, Africa, South Africa, now this global South is emerging. There's 40 countries wants to join uh, uh, BRICS countries, and then you have, of course, China, uh, African Cooperation Summit, China, Latin American, China, uh, Arab Summit, China, Central Asia. So China has been really become a, a strong pushing force for the globalization now. So. Uh, for the economic globalizing, uh, you know, rather than we are seeing the, the NATO has been, of course, enlarged, you know, uh, uh, because of the, this war or not, but uh, but also we have, uh, 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 you know, the Quran, which was in fact the mini NATO being placed in Asia, and then we have AUKUS, where nuclear submarine technology has been proliferated to a now nuclear region and country. And then, of course, we have uh, you know the uh, the uh, IPAF, even that's more geopolitical. Uh, and now we see the, chip, the trade war, we see the chip war, we see the uh, tech war, and, and then all those uh, surrounding uh, China uh, stuff. So, so that's really a concern people. I, I I still want to think that uh, economic globalization. You know, let's let's really, even though economic globalization may have a lot of problems, but I think the trend should be uh, we should continue that. So in that perspective, I think Belt and Road Initiative is probably the, the largest globalization, economic globalization platform or, or plan that has been launched, which has really got a lot of uh, uh, attention. 140 countries signed the MOU with China, 30, 40 international organizations like UN and many others actually uh, signed MOU with China. So, so we see this 180 organization that has all in join this big, uh, uh, gigantic, uh, you know, uh, economic plan to revitalize the global economy, global infrastructure, and global, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, clean technology and and silk road, the digital silk road, and, and what have you. And that is really benefiting the global south because we haven't seen 
a major country. I mean, that's really China's contribution to the globalization because China benefited from the globalization. China now is really contributing back to developing countries. I mean, Professor uh, Kishu Mabani just mentioned about those success stories that China has on, on, on the African, you know, in uh, the, the railway, in, in Indonesia, in, in Laos, and, uh, and of course in, in Kenya also, they have a successful railway there too. So many, many examples like that, ports, connectivity, 5G, and, and all the rest. So, so I think this, uh, this Belt and Road is really uh, a biggest, the stabilizer for the you know, developing country for the economy. Of course, Belt and Road is not perfect. I mean, it has, it has problems, issues, challenges, but, it's, it, it, but by far, it's the largest uh, economic plan for the developing countries that ever offer. I mean, I heard many ambassadors told me here in Beijing, said, look, I mean, we hear a lot of good things about uh, uh, Western countries, but where are the plans? Where are the, where are the big, big project to help us? So I think at least Belt and Road have done quite a lot of that already. And it's also good to see now, it's interesting to see that uh, uh, US and, and, and EU now trying to, uh, 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 you know, copy uh, this plan. And now, of course, I mean, we're welcome. That. I mean, now they have proposed the Build Back Battle World, BCW, and then they have proposed the EU Global Gateway, all focus on infrastructure, you know, trying to help developed countries, which is great. I mean, I'm glad to see that, that uh, uh, they finally realized that developing country has a huge infrastructure and a connectivity needs. I mean, they all come up with different plans now. So, so I think it now the, 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 the key is now, why can't we have a, uh, you know, BRI, you know, B3W, uh, Global Gate, we work together. I mean, that would be really great. I mean, we are, we are now having also those uh, tensions or have another, so much differences. We should find some common grounds, common objectives. So helping Global South and helping developing countries and uh, with all those uh, new plans would be great uh, responsibility of, of the G, you know, of the, of the G3, you know, if you talk about three largest economy in the world. I mean, they have a moral responsibility to work together. So, so I think that uh, I'm very glad to see just, just a week ago, uh, probably 10 days ago, that European Foreign Minister, Vice Chairman uh, Joseph Borrell has met China Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and they said, Borrell said, probably, uh, you know, now EU Global Gateway can work with uh, BI. They don't see how, <laughs> they don't contradict that they could be complementary. So this is really a good sign. I really hope that uh, more discussions, more explanations, uh, can explorations can be followed on that. And I, I would even like to see B3W, Build Back Better World, to work together with BI. So I think BI is a good example, 10 years ahead already, and whereas B3W, Global Gateway is only one year, less than two years old, and we should really all work together. So in that sense, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the US is, 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 is leading the World Bank, and China is leading the AIB, and we have ADB, Japan is leading, and we have AFDB, you know, European Construction Bank. You know, we have also BRICS, new development banks. I mean, why not have all those development banks work together? Let's, let's get a big chunk of, uh, you know, B3W, EU Gateway, and BI. I mean, we form an international development consortia, and then, you know, we could probably work together. So, so I see this as... Uh, Opportunities, rather than so this as, as a geopolitical uh, rivalry, I, I really see this as economic uh, globalization as as a pathway for us to get out of this uh, geopolitical mess. And let's focus again, go back uh, to the basic uh, fundamentals of improving the livelihood of the people of, of all the developing countries, and of course, developed countries too. So, so in that sense, I want to say that why, you know, we should really work together. I'm glad to see uh, uh, UK is joining the CPTPP and China should join that. I hope American could come back and, you know, I mean, let's all have a more platform to talk about different uh, uh, corporation. So that's, that's really uh, uh, my view is that BI can stimulate another round of a new globalization. BI can really usher in a new focus on the development infrastructure, Whereas China already uh, done that very well, lifted 800 million people out of poverty, built the largest uh, infrastructure networks, most advanced in the world. I mean, if you talk about uh, infrastructure, I mean, just give an example. The total length of uh, fast train networks in China is equal to the next 10 countries combined. Whereas the US military budget is equal to the next 10 countries combined. So you can see that China is concentrated on economic construction and, then, and that really should be continued 
not only for China, but for the world. And, and, and we hope that all the countries can work together. So finally, just a word about Taiwan. Uh, you know, uh, Joanna mentioned about Taiwan Street. I, I, I still also think that economic integration should be really the way to go because uh, I remember that before Taiwan took over, you know, five or six million mainlanders to, you know, flooded the Taiwan and then it prospered Taiwan. We have, a, a, you know, the Taiwan enjoys the biggest trade surplus with mainland. There's about one million or two million Taiwanese working in, uh, in the mainland. And we have, uh, you know, 300 to a half a million husband and wives in marriage in, in Taiwan across the streets. And then we have, uh, you know, many student exchanges too. So, so I think this economic globalization will eventually happen if we continue that momentum and let's, you know, stick to the 92 consensus. I mean, everything will be uh, gradually uh, uh, build, it, build it up and then through the economic integration. I mean, I was, uh, I was uh, visiting the European, uh, 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 Brussels, the European Commission, uh, uh, you know, just in May this year, and I met in a group of officials and they told me, they said they are, they are grandfather or from uh, or their parents or whatever from different countries germany <laughs> france italy and 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 uh, netherlands everybody but then you know their, their their grandfather may fight for each other but now they are all sitting there peacefully so eu is a great uh, peace project asean uh, like uh, kisha has many mentioned many times is a great peace project so i don't see why you know, uh, across the street, the, the, the people from both sides of across the Taiwan they speak the same language, enjoying the same f f culture, food, heritage, you know, all those things. We cannot get together. I mean, we, we certainly can. So if, as, uh, as Joanna mentioned, if we have less foreign interference and if we really stick to this uh, uh, peaceful reunification, I mean, I don't see that will not happen. You know, let's really increase, intensify the people to people exchanges. Let's have all the, you know, let's have a few million Taiwanese walking in China and have a 10 million tourists from mainland uh, uh, visiting Taiwan. I'm sure they will, uh, they will get along and they will get together and then they won't separate. So I'm, I'm cautious and optimistic. I think we should have less, uh, you know, interference from outside so there could be less exercises and less, uh, you know, the, China was promote, provoked by all those, uh, uh, you know, different uh, violation of, of uh, uh, three communique and many things. But, you know, if we really calm down, I mean, things will get much better. So, uh, so I think I, I believe that even people with different language, different culture, different ethnic nationality, they get along. <laughs> Asia and uh, and uh, and the EU is a good example. Uh, why can't we, uh, uh, you know, Chinese across the street? I mean, absolutely, we can. So. So I want to conclude, I think economic, uh, BRI and all the economic arrangement would be really a great way to go. Uh, let's, let's improve on that. So I'll, I'll stop there and maybe uh, who, who is next? Let me chime in because uh, Shazim actually told us to introduce the next speaker. So would you like to introduce Yi Wei or would you like us to do that? <laughs> well, let us now just welcome Professor Wang Yi Wei, uh, another really honorable guest speaker for today's topic. Yi Wei, take it from here, please. Thank you. C can you uh, see my PPT? No. No, it's okay. Uh, no, we, we no. still can't see it. Um, oh, no, yes, we oh, can. Okay. But you because probably need to change it into the uh, PPT mode, okay. and not just your screen. Okay. So now it's okay? Better? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, the uh, organizer to have this opportunity to share my views of the reflection of the uh, 10 years of the BI, what kind of uh, uh, achievements we made, uh, what kind of lessons, what kind of implications uh, for the coming future. Okay, um, what would be, uh, I think it's be quite successful, uh, no doubt. Uh, why? Because the U.S. and the European Union also have their version of the BI. 
153 countries and plus uh, 32 uh, international organizations. The sign MOU uh, of the BRI with uh, China. You know, uh, among uh, 181 uh, countries, we have uh, diplomatic relations and 193 uh, members of the United Nations. So majority of the whole world actually joined the BI. Quite an achievement, so of course. And uh, that's reason uh, the US and the European Union also they want to hedge or balance and put forward their own uh, BI. So that's uh, definitely a uh, great achievement. And uh, the World Bank uh, 2019 uh, published a very important report on the BRI economy uh, indicate uh, that uh, if the, all the projects of BRI fully implemented, they will leave the poverty of uh, more than 32 million. Uh, so that's a huge contribu contribution to the SDG. Uh, uh, in uh, September, we will have the mid review of the SDG. Uh, China actually uh, had of 10 years achieve all the goals, uh, particularly of the lift of poverty. So Chinese modernization actually very attractive to uh, the world, particularly to the developing countries. If China can, why not uh, those countries? You know, before the opening reform, uh, China's per capita GDP is only uh, one third of the South Sahara uh, African countries. Why? Why, why we achieved, uh, why those uh, African countries are all uh, developing countries now, even like South Africa used to be the uh, developed country, but now it's developing country. So what, what we can share with our modernization experience. The second, uh, what kind of lessons we can uh, learn, uh, we can be, do better, of course. And uh, what, what about the future? So the three basic questions. The first, uh, what are we uh, achieved? These are the five pillars of the uh, Belarus Initiative, the policy coordination that uh, Chinese dream and the other countries uh, dreams with their dream dream together, great harmony. So not to replace somebody's dream, we are share the synergy with the strategies. And the second, uh, facility connectivity, like the Laos, Kakata, the railway, from the air, the maritime, and the land, and, and also internet. Uh, like uh, China ASEAN uh, information port, uh, huge projects and uh, digitalization, and uh, impacted trade, uh, e-commerce, like China uh, Europe uh, Rail Express, uh, actually uh, connected Chinese uh, more than uh, uh, you know uh, uh, sixty uh, cities, with uh, uh, more than twenty five countries in the Europe, uh, is uh, among the. 200 cities, actually. So it's very important, uh, particularly during the COVID period. So in the e-commerce, now more and more countries, uh, for instance, in Malaysia, they, have, they use e-commerce, Alipay, and all this uh, digitalization of RMB and, uh, uh, and, and, and the digital currency. The finance corporation, uh, definitely, uh, we, we have the uh, Silk Road Fund and uh, also PPP model and uh, EPC, all kinds of other, many third party uh, cooperation uh, actually be highlighted. For instance, the UK also financed in the China, Pakistan economic corridor, Saudi Arabia, uh, the GAF and the OPEC uh, now are ready to, uh, to join the BI financing, maybe uh, Islamic finance or the sovereign funds. And people to people exchange. And now Chinese people, uh, uh, they can have the Chinese passport, can go, can visit many countries, including European countries without need for visa. All those are uh, actually the five pillars uh, making uh, lots of achievements. And uh, we, we, can, we can think about why China put forward the Bell Initiative that some people think about the only the number one nations in the world, like the U US after the World War II put forward the Marshall Plan. Why China actually is the number two world economy. 10 years ago, uh, the only 60% uh, less of the US GDP can put forward the BRI. But 10 years ago, actually, uh, China's uh, uh, industrial uh, values uh, overpassed the US as the number one industrial power in the world. Uh, and China has the most completed uh, categories of all the industry systems. So that reason, uh, anything built or constructed by China is most efficient 
and the court's lobbyist. Uh, that's very important, as uh, Professor Magbuni mentioned about the foreign aid of the West, actually it's lots of money wasted and found by themselves. The, the recipient countries benefit very less. But China's investment actually uh, is more focused on the local people and then infrastructure building is to share the experience of China if we want to get rich, build the road. So I think that's uh, basically the China as a world factory. Uh, we, we, we can provide something that the US even cannot provide. The US uh, uh, actually industrialization happened 100 years ago, or even 200 years ago. Now the more private companies, uh, private capitals, more, not so much interest in the financing the uh, infrastructure, even domestically of, China, of the United States. So how, how can you rely on the US financing the uh, infrastructure for other countries? I think that also uh, this China is uh, volunteer to uh, change the path with the so-called engagement with the United States. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, before China, made in China as one force go to the uh, US and one force go to American, uh, the European market. Actually, uh, China as a world factory, only 20% uh, made in China can be consumed by the Chinese people domestically. So majority of the made in China should go to abroad. So not, not just go to the US and the European market after the global financial crisis, debt crisis, uh, the, work, the middle class shrinking. They cannot buy so many uh, so-called made in China, so-called the overcapacity problems come and then China need to discover the new uh, emerging markets. So that's the Bell Rail initiative was launched. So we need to make money uh, outside of the developing country, developed country, but the developing countries majority. So what's uh, particularly what we uh, achieved? Uh, I think this, uh, the first one is uh, it's a proactive uh, strategic shift. In the uh, past 100 years, China is also eyes the West. And so we look to the West, we can learn from the West, integrate with the West. But actually China is difficult to be uh, westernized as a so huge country, uh, population country. So now China not just uh, uh, eyes down to the West, but also to uh, developing countries. So this is, we said, the dual uh, circulation uh, strategy in the globalization. Now China also put for the dual circulation uh, domestically. The second, I think that China, uh, China uh, not just the follow uh, of the West, but now it's a leading country. Some people even say China is a superpower. I say China is a super nation state, uh, super developing countries. So what China can achieve, actually, uh, we can... Uh, as a, as a, maybe it's a model for other BRICS and other different countries, as I, we mentioned. Thirdly, I think that we are redesigning the future of the globalization. Uh, without the BRI, now uh, the globalization is in danger. So um, the BRI uh, actually uh, points that the globalization is still the direction, but it needs more balance and need more inclusive, and need more win-win and uh, sustainable. So focus on the developing countries actually is the potential of the new directions, profits comes from those countries. So I think that's what we, we do uh, successfully. Fourthly, uh, I think the BRI, the principles, uh, we say uh, it's, a, it's a build of all, by all, and for all. Uh, that kind of principles are not, uh, are not so many challenges by the West. Even uh, we say Wutong, uh, the five pillars of the mutual connectivities. This is also uh, uh, draw the uh, right direction for cooperation. We are not want to replace other countries' uh, strategy. We are synergies for the strategies. The West actually uh, not a question about the principles of the BRI. The only question about why is China, not the US or any, or any other Western countries to do that? Uh, so I mean, the BRI do the right thing, uh, the point to the right direction. Even their question about, you have your uh, Chinese intention want to achieve or influence. So they are all have their own, they want to balance the China's influence. That means it's, uh, they do the, 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 the right thing. Also uh, the fifth, I think uh, the BRI uh, changing uh, transformation, we say uh, the second summit, uh, so focus on the high quality. That means for green, it's like the AI idealization of a BRI, lean, green, clean. Uh, I think that's the right direction. Uh, and also more and more countries, not just sign uh, BRI MOU with China, but also uh, the Community of the Shared Future with, with China. So this, uh, I think, uh, jointly uh, make China and the and the, the the world more connected. 
So that's the, uh, I think we achievements, maybe uh, some, uh, and then uh, the second part, uh, lessons uh, for the past the decades. So this is the, uh, the, the double uh, loop of value chain uh, system of the BRI. So what lessons we can learn from the BRI in the past uh, decade. First lesson, um, put forward by President Xi 10 years ago, but only 10 years later, uh, they have the versions and actions jointly by the three uh, ministers, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of uh, Commerce, uh, and, uh, and the RC. But uh, uh, NDRC is play more important role and the Minister of Foreign Affairs so they coordinate with the, with the external uh, power countries. If you read uh, the version and actions, actually this is very limited. It's only more focused on the Eurasia continent. So it's more um, Asian Silk Road, uh, but now it's globalized. So maybe um, it's not too much ambitions uh, at the beginning. So we, maybe Trump uh, contributed a lot. So after the election of the Donald Trump, so more countries uh, share their strong interest to BI. Uh, maybe China is the leader of the uh, globalization. And the second, uh, the BI uh, with the goal uh, is to uh, move uh, the globalization towards balance, uh, sustainable, and inclusive. But now uh, the problem is that the globalization is in danger, or it's in transition. So what was the goal of the BRI? Uh, actually, only in 2013, President Xi put forward that the BRI, the goal is not just achieve the so-called China WTO or China-centric world, world order, but it's one to uh, to build the committee of shared future. But many people may be confused about the committee of shared future because uh, uh, one God, uh, uh, the committee, maybe the shared destiny. But China with that Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, there's such reason we can go beyond the uh, so-called universalism, uh, six common uh, values of the all human being. So that the uh, community of shared future, uh, even in the digital civilization, uh, China and the US also, also share the community uh, because it's not industrial civilization anymore, but now it's a uh, uh, community to each other. So maybe it's too, uh, a little bit late uh, to point that the BI, the goal is to build a community of shared future and explaining to the outside world what's the meaning of the, global, uh, uh, of the community of shared future. The BI originally was called the One Bell One Road, uh, later the, the Bell Road Initiative, but the, today, the community of shared future for common density now is a uh, share, uh, uh, for humankind is a different translation make uh, people confused. So that reason, I think uh, we need uh, both uh, expl uh, explaining uh, BI and also the community of shared future. What is the meaning and the mechanism to how to how to achieve the uh, community? Thirdly, uh, maybe the lessons we can learn is uh, all the MOU signed with is bilateral with the Chinese government. Uh, how about the local government? How about the NGO? If the government change, like Italy, uh, the new populist, the different populist uh, uh, government, uh, currently is more pro the US. So they 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 want to uh, not continue to sign and then wanting to so called the quit. So how to avoid this from happening again? So we need to consult with all government. We say deep state maybe, uh, not just the current government. Third, uh, the fourthly, uh, the third party market uh, cooperation is a very good idea, but we don't have so many good examples. Um, people mention about uh, China and France in the Senegal and the water stage uh, projects in China, Japan, but not so many. Uh, so we need to uh, promote have a more model for, uh, to attract more Western companies to, inv uh, to invest. So far, of course, many Western companies join. Uh, for instance, I visited Kuwait, uh, the finance of the uh, 20 billion US dollars for the new campus. The uh, majority, 80%, actually constructed by Chinese companies. But the consulting, uh, even before uh, the environment uh, or uh, sustainable, all, all those uh, software are actually designed by the West, uh, like the McKinsey. So they make the huge money, actually, but the people don't not, not pay attention to that. So people only uh, focus on the US uh, band BRI. Actually, the US companies join, uh, band, uh, make huge money in the projects. So that's the, uh, maybe we can learn lessons. And then the, the, the third part, what uh, 
or the coming future. So the coming future, uh, the world actually is now divided. Uh, it's like a so-called rule-based international order, like the right, the Chinese eat noodles with the left hand still uh, WeChat or online. And then the West claim uh, that you save one hand is the unfair competition. And you, in the name of the safety or security, the ban Huawei, uh, so that that's the uh, the world divided. Uh, so that's uh, uh, major challenges for the BI in the coming future. And then uh, for the future of the BI, it's not just the reform the globalization. The USA actually revolution, uh, revolution of the uh, BI uh, of the globalization. We want to build a de-risk, the de-channelized globalization. So that's basically uh, it's a it's a huge challenge for the BI. So the many countries like uh, like Swana want to take side between China and the US. The US also want uh, Italy to quit because Italy will be the rotating presidency of the G7 next year. So US won if you uh, not quit and then you cannot take a leading role in the G7 because uh, the US led G7 in the West and they said that, they said that it's against the China led BI. Actually it's not China led, it's, uh, it's not contradicted. It's not a zero sum game. And the second, uh, maybe we can um, we can do better. Uh, it's about the financing. Before it's a the build operation uh, transfer like uh, Tanzania Zambia railways, but that's not so successful in the economic running. It's political contribution. And then more the EPC model, so the environment uh, uh, engineering procurement construction now plus investment uh, plus uh, finance. It's not also not works on well like Ukraine. We finance the. Uh, the billions of the US dollars in the building uh, the ports and the, the subways in the Ukraine. Now there's a war. So who will pay back? Uh, because we need 10 years, maybe uh, at least, to pay back the, under the EPC model. But now, uh, so no one can, can, uh, can pay for that. And then the so-called the PPP model, uh, but the private companies, uh, including in China, uh, they feel the difficulty to uh, involve because uh, Stay on on the prices play a more important role, and then developed countries, particularly in Africa, they more trust the Chinese government, they more trust the central government, and more trust the stay on on the prices. They not so much trust of the third party like the European companies and then private companies. So that problem, and also for uh, how to do that. Uh, at the beginning, we say one country one uh, policy, but now people say this is unfair competition. So we need to coordinate and make the you know. Uh, bilateral to multilateral, but it's very low efficiency in coordinate. So political uh, circle and economic circle and uh, maybe uh, invest is uh, not so coordinated. The third challenge is actually the, uh, the BRI countries. They are contradicted. The economic may be developing country, uh, not so developed, but uh, the political system, the software actually is a West, even double. For instance, the Meritus I visit, they have two legal systems uh, because of the colonized by France and the Britain uh, separately. So the two uh, legal systems, the, how, how to coordinate? So China, we say they coordinate the China model, the, 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 the BRI countries model, or uh, the colonial model, or international model, or standards, or like African Union's standard. So different levels of the standards need to coordinate is by take time. The force uh, maybe is for China. Uh, the major challenges for China now economic growing uh, not so rapidly, not so strong. Uh, the Chinese people not so not so much uh, support, even uh, the youth unemployment. Uh, and then the Chinese people even think about the outside world. It's also many dangers, many risks. Uh, if you hire the Chinese workers to uh, to work outside of China, it's uh, difficult. Whatever you pay. So that's also a um, problem. The fifth, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, safety of the infrastructure, like the North uh, Stream, uh, the third, the second explored. Uh, people say there may be the NATO or the US, but how to, um, the US warming, uh, whatever you, you build the infrastructure, uh, the US or the NATO easy to destroy this. So make the many countries worry about it to build the infrastructure, it's maybe it's in danger. So what, what we can do better? So what China can learn from the past uh, experience or lessons? I think the first lesson we can learn is uh, the BRI is uh, to show the comparative advantages of China, like uh, our system. 
we have a strong stay on on the prices. We are the uh, uh, manufacturing power. But if you say the International Capacity Corporation make the Chinese uh, industries transfer to Vietnam, to Myanmar, to India, make China also suffer like, uh, like the US, uh, this is some challenge. Uh, maybe Chinese people think about it's unhealthy uh, in the long term for China. And the, and, the, and the West also competed with China. They learn from the BI, actually. The second, uh, China's comparative advantage as the uh, most uh, completed of the industries or the cluster of the industries. Uh, whether, whether they can continue, the Americans, so called the India Pacific strategy, want to replace China uh, with India as a new world factory and the, and the leader of the global south. And they even claim China is not a different country anymore. So then China's investment of foreign aid is not just according to the South-South cooperation. So it's also a uh, challenge. And of course, uh, other challenges as well, uh, like um, uh, the BRI's goal, uh, we said is uh, we focus on external uh, market making money. But now uh, it's not just the market expansion, but also uh, system. The basic logic of the globalization and the international system is now in danger, it's in transition. Uh, the, the developing countries not industrialized yet, but now digitalized. Uh, the huge you know, press and the depths uh, after the three years COVID, the European, uh, the, the many like uh, Sri Lanka and uh, African countries, the Chinese uh, government volunteer to cut uh, 77 uh, countries of the, the depths uh, to China two years ago. But uh, Chinese people will complain about that. And also Chinese government put forward a dual circulation strategy. And then many people question about whether China more focus on the domestic circular uh, consumer driven uh, economic growth uh, to provide enough jobs. For instance, this year, 12 million uh, university students graduate. So we need to find the jobs for them. The 20, more than 20% of the employment of the youth. It's not that we don't have enough opportunities, but the uh, the expectation for work, maybe uh, it's not, uh, for instance, in Beijing, 5,000 yuan uh, per month is not attractive to those. Even they stay home, they do not want to work. So how to uh, encourage them to work in the BRI countries? And then so-called high quality of the BRI uh, construction. Uh, what's the mean with high quality? The, uh, the US and the Europeans say high quality, high quality, but it's too high. Maybe it's not adapted to the local conditions. And China also focused on high quality, how to coordinate uh, high quality and the private companies and then different mechanisms and uh, for financing. So we need to top down and button up all, all those to coordinate with uh, central and the local governments and the NGOs, even trap or in like, a, you know, in like in Pakistan. There's not, uh, you know, in a, in a period, uh, some provinces and also governed so well. So uh, I think there are three difficult uh, difficulties in the coming future. The first difficulty, as I mentioned, uh, there is a uh, um, decouple or the de-risk. Uh, so globalization is in danger. Uh, even uh, we say reform the globalization is not the direction. Uh, so people worry about uh, whether the world will be divided at the US-led Western uh, globalization or uh, China-led the BRI globalization, uh, so-called the new cold world. And the second uh, challenge is so we say the BRI is contribute to the internationalization of RMB, uh, but uh, so far the US, uh, US dollar hegemonic power is uh, difficult to be challenged. The internationalization of RMB is very limited. So-called debt trap because China is not OECD member. So that's reason the Paris club uh, uh, with, the final, uh, with the IMF of the World Bank and the OECD to jointly uh, have the fin global financial uh, governance. China, we say we are still Different country, we are not joined uh, OECD. So uh, the China, they have different uh, coordinate with the uh, the Paris club of the debt. So that's the, also the reason with the debt trap. And then RMB internationalization also uh, fails the long arm certification of the US, uh, like the two Huawei and the many Chinese, not just the Chinese and the, even uh, the foreign uh, companies, that they are to involve the financing because they're worried about the US uh, sanctions. The third uh, difficulties, uh, trans transformation to the digital, green, the smart, and also to, to deal with the COVID, uh, post-COVID, the challenges. So we need to both uh, industrialization, uh, digitalization, we need to both economic growth and uh, to cut the debts, all of those 
uh, coordinate, difficult to coordinate. And the fourth, as I mentioned, uh, is uh, so-called the duality problem, the how to, to deal with the uh, the BRI countries, actually, the government is changing rapidly, and then they are still uh, thinking about, uh, they, they want to learn from, from the West. They are, they are not trust so much about, about China, it can be long-term, to provide a security guarantee for them. China is only, say, the world suffered a so-called dilemma that the development is more uh, with, with China, but the security safety is, uh, is more with the United States. When China and the US confronted each other, that those countries felt the dilemma. It's like uh, it's Australia and many uh, BI countries. So again, uh, the BI, the goal, I think is uh, for the SDG and uh, even long-term to build the committee of the shared future. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, in the current difficulties, China domestically folks, China's external relations with the United States, with the West in general, many challenges. So how to coordinate, how to uh, contribute continually, jointly with the Western companies and the countries? And with the NGOs, not just with the central governments. All this, I would like to hear maybe your suggestions. We can do better in the future, I'm sure. So thank you for the uh, for the invitation. Uh, I have two. I have ten books actually for the BRI, and then uh, I have a, recently I have a new book for the children. So better if you uh, I can meet you and then give to you uh, different versions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yi Wei. Uh, I want to thank all three uh, speakers this morning. Joanne, who uh, in her usual eloquence uh, talked about <clears throat> the BRI and also talked about the current challenges of Taiwan and what Taiwan could be learning from Ukraine. Um, of course, it's always good to listen to Henry, Henry Wang, Wang Huiyao, who is one of the few people in China who constantly uh, engages in extensive discussions with Western uh, intellectuals and policy makers in trying to understand uh, what are the origins of our uh, of the problem between the West and the East, in particular between the United States and China. And finally, of course, uh, it is always good to hear <clears throat> from Wang Yiwei, who in his uh, expertise, he is an expertise, both in economic views, as well as uh, political views, as well as the views of Chinese politics, uh, what are the challenges of the Belt and Road Initiative? When I first learned about the Belt and Road Initiative, which was in 2015, uh, 2016, which is already three years after Xi Jinping's uh, famous two speeches in Kazakhstan and Indonesia. I started to ask myself the following question. The question is, how would this change? How would the Belt and Road Initiative change the fundamental mindset of the Chinese people? Would they just go on this, at what they have been doing before? Or will this be a new daylight in the Chinese mindset? I looked at what I learned in high school in Singapore, a gentleman named Zhang Qian in the Han Dynasty. He was sent to the western, western side of China, which is probably Central Asia today. And in Baidu, they referred to him, and to my great surprise, as the first Chinese who opens his eyes to see the world. 
Well, by the time Han Dynasty is around, that's already a few thousand years of Chinese history. And yet in those two few thousand years, only Zhang Qian was the first person to open his eyes to see the world. That was surprising to me. The second surprising to me was that when I visited Kaifeng, <coughs> when I visited Kaifeng in China, oh, about eight years ago, I learned that in Kaifeng during the Song Dynasty, there was, there existed in the city of Kaifeng a very large, large number of Jewish uh, people living there. And these people in, in Kaifeng, the Jews in Kaifeng, were able to live their own lifestyle. Uh, they even have synagogues in Kaifeng, or at least the relics of synagogues today, that we have seen it. So where did it come from, I asked myself. Well, the answer is fairly obvious. They came from the Western side of Asia. I guess places like Palestine, Iraq, Iran, and so on. And, and then I said, how did they travel? Well, they travel through the so-called Silk Road, which is the reason why we are even talking about the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, if the Belt and Road is a Silk Road, it's not a one-way street, right? I mean, people come and people go. So if the Jews can come from the West to China, shouldn't the Chinese be the same from going from China to the West? That didn't happen. As far as I could tell, there were no Chinese ever found in the Western side of Asia. And now you may say, well, the roads are difficult. Well, it's pretty difficult for the Jews also, but somehow they overcome this, but the Chinese did not. And the reason I think deep, deep down was China and the Chinese were a very inward looking people. The inward looking is almost part of the DNA of China. I give you another very interesting example of how inward China would be. You know, there are over 3000 universities in China today, maybe more now. My, my data is a few days uh, old, a few years old. Of all these three universities in, in, uh, in, in, in China, you can actually find only a handful of those that will have any interest in studying South Asia. By that, I mean Pakistan, India, and so on. Well, India is not a small country and it's a close neighbor. Today, it's, it's even bigger than China in terms of population. It has just surpassed China in population. And Indians, whether you like them or don't like them, they are not gonna go away. So you better learn how to like them or at least understand their lifestyle, their ways and means, their history, and so on. Only then that nations, between nations, can one find some credible way of finding ways to coexist. So that's why I thought the Belt and Road was such a fantastic initiative. 
what Xi Jinping has proposed is not just to construct infrastructure in these, these so-called Belt and Road uh, countries. It is also demanding or asking Chinese people in no uncertain terms that we need to understand the people of different cultures, of different lifestyles, even the different kind of food they eat. We cannot just assume that what they, what they know is not that important to us because they are important to us. With that in mind, I began my six or seven years of deep interest on the Belt and Road Initiative. And the re end result was a book called China's Millennium Transformation, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is published by World Scientific, which I'm very grateful for. And I'm also very grateful that this month, a Chinese translation by a team of nine translators from Hainan University will be published. So I think for the West to sort of poo poo the Belt and Road Initiative is a profoundly unfortunate thing. Profoundly, because as far as I can tell, this is the new normal for foreign diplomacy. It's even new normal for China because until the Belt and Road Initiative came along, I am sure the mindset of the Chinese foreign policy is not what it is today. I want to especially thank Professor Browdingen of Johns Hopkins. I never met her. Um, she's obviously un un unbelievably brilliant and you should all read her, her papers and watch her YouTube uh, lectures. But she gave me an understanding of how China worked in Africa even before the Belt and Road Initiative. It's not the technology. It's not the economics, as she said. It's the attitude of the Chinese people and the Chinese policy maker. When the attitude is wrong or flawed, it's hard to do anything right. Thank you. Now we begin by people who want to ask questions. I have actually quickly browsed through all the questions. So uh, let me kick off the first <coughs> couple of ones for sure. And then the others could also join in. But before the questions, there were three comments that could be very interesting to all. One is Bill Road Initiative could tie it up with green growth and communication facets. And I think actually, it did. The second is China never seized any an asset from any country due to default. So this is an argument counter the debt trap argument. And the third one is labor abundant developing countries may contribute to the build and road initiative. And the person said, you know, how's China's view on this? And as far as I know, the locals um, in those countries. Um, especially with the major infrastructure projects are actually part of that um, building workforce. So Kishore, here are two questions for you. One is how to counter the strong Western narrative. And the second one, uh, they're all together three. Second one is you know, how is Indian's position on Build Road Initiative? Would the youth in India um, actually suffer through not participating in this or missing the opportunity? And the third one is Italy. 
What's your view on why Italy is now contemplating leaving Build and Road Initiative? Are they really not receiving any benefit or is it a populist move or pressure from US and NATO? So these are three questions um, directly asking Kishore and based on your comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Um, well, let, me, let me respond quickly because I know there'll be uh, other questions. First one on how to counter the Western narrative. I think it's important to understand that this Western narrative uh, is not just driven by the media. Uh, it is part of the much larger geopolitical contest that has broken up between the United States and China. You know, and you know that my, this, my book has China won, which has also been translated into Chinese, uh, discusses that. And it is since the United States is trying very hard to preserve its number one position and keep China in the number two position, uh, it obviously is not in the interest of the United States to see China succeed uh, in the BRI. And therefore, the, China, the United States will do its very best to ensure that the BRI fails in one way or another. If they can't stop the projects, they can stop the, they, they can alter the perceptions of what China uh, is doing. So this, what is happening, the distortion of the Western media on BRI is part of a much larger geopolitical struggle. And since that geopolitical struggle will carry on for the next 10 years, I guarantee you that the distortion of the BRI in the Western media will carry on for the next 10 years. It's part of the geopolitical contest. It's one instrument that the United States is using to maintain its uh, uh, advantageous position in the contest. Uh, but nonetheless, by the way, this doesn't mean you should give up. And, and I'm glad that uh, that's one Feng referred also again, also to Deborah Brautigam, because it's people like her uh, who are brave enough to stand up that who should we should listen to and we should also uh, share her views more widely. There are people like, there are other Deborah Brotigans, by the way, she's not the only one. The second point on India, uh, I think the Indian decision not to join the BRI is also related to the broader relationship between China and India, which was more or less stable and comfortable uh, for quite a while, indeed, it was improving quite a bit when Prime Minister Narendra Modi came in because Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President Xi Jinping spent a lot of time with each other, talking to each other. And, and they, in fact, they spent more time than any other two world leaders have. But as you know, there was an unfortunate uh, skirmish at the border in June 2020. And since June 2020, relations between China and India have been uncomfortable. And some, in some cases, there's been some hostility too. So as long as relations remain uncomfortable and as long as there are problems at the border between China and India, I predict that China, India will not join the, uh, the BRI. And of course, India has a specific issue about the China-Pakistan economic corridor going through uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, which is, of course, as you know, claimed by India. So, so that's another problem. But at the same time, I want to emphasize that even though India has not participated in the BRI, India is actually a very active player in the New Development Bank, uh, the BRICS Bank, in, 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 which is based in China. India has accepted loans from uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And indeed, India is, I think, the single biggest borrower, I think, from AIIB. I may be wrong, but I think that, that's what I remember reading. So India, India's cooperation with China, therefore, in other areas can continue, even though India doesn't, will not become formally a member of BRI. Now, in the case of Italy, there's no question that Italy's decision to leave uh, is driven uh, by pressures, external pressures, and clearly, the United States has been putting a lot of pressure uh, on European countries to opt out of uh, the BRI. I mean, clearly, because the success of the BRI is seen as a loss uh, for United States. The failure of the BRI 
is seen as a win for the United States. So for the United States, uh, since Italy was the only G member of the G7 that had signed on to BRI, the United States uh, put a lot of pressure on Italy. And of course, as you know, one of the consequences uh, of the Ukraine war is that the European, can, the Europe as a whole has fundamentally lost its strategic autonomy. Uh, Europe was positioning itself uh, somewhere hopefully in the middle between uh, China and the United States. But as a result of the fact that the Europeans need the United States in the war in Ukraine, they have become in some ways <laughs> indebted to the United States. And maybe that's a good example of debt trap diplomacy. <laughs> that Europe today is in such debt to the United States that they have to... Uh, bend to United States uh, will and 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 uh, in that sense. So I can understand why Italy are under pressure. But I won't be surprised if many Italians are uh, in private very unhappy about Italy leaving uh, the BRI because you know at the end of the day, the Italian economy doesn't have many good growth prospects. The biggest market for Italian products will, will still be China. And especially at a time when China is producing the world's largest middle class, for Italy to sacrifice the Chinese middle class market, Italy is going against its own interests. And if at some point in time, Italy rejoins the BRI, I also will not be surprised. But at the end of the day, uh, this is all about geopolitics. Um, as usual, words of wisdom from Kishore. Um, I have um, the question asking all three speakers on how can China improving its BRI messaging, very close to what Kishore was asked on the first one. And now there were a series of questions for Yi Wei. So I'm going to read you some of it so that you can prepare yourself. And then I'll come back to um, uh, Hui Yao for, for a very key question for him to address. So for Professor Yi Wei, people ask you about BRI's potential role in, for example, stopping Ukrainian war and stabilizing world economy, uh, whether there is possibility for BRI to have a common currency. Um, in the worsened economic situation in China, can China still have the financial power to continue um, its BRI initiative? And there's um, common Western criticism about lack of public participation or transparency, and what's your take on that? So these are for Yi Wei to address later. And for uh, Professor Hui Yao, um, you did mention about other initiatives, such as um, um, th the question asked about BRI and other plans. And so if I mistaken your question, you can come back later. I assume it is because you mentioned about Build Back Better and European Gateway. So are there ways for BRI to work with other plans? It's a, a question to your presentation. So Professor Huiya, would you please start? Sure, uh, thank you, uh, Joanna. And uh, I think the, uh, uh, as Yiwei mentioned, China has started this uh, uh, infrastructure uh, Belt and Road Plan. I mean, also, of course, not limited infrastructure, but also other uh, connectivity uh, activities too. So. The, the, I think CCG, I think that we actually participated in the European Union quite a few years ago, uh, Eurasia Connectivity Index uh, studies. Basically, I think it's uh, evolved from that to the current uh, uh, EU uh, uh, gateway, global gateway. And uh, uh, so I think there's a lot of similarities actually, because it's all emphasized uh, uh, a lot of on infrastructure, there's a lot of emphasis on, on, on clean technology and clean and, and the green and, and all those, uh, 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 you know, emphasis. And, uh, and of course, uh, there's, uh, there's all want to avoid uh, that trap and all the, want to uh, be more uh, connected. And they're also involving more international agencies' uh, uh, participation. And of course, uh, Belt and Road already have 30, 40 international organizations aim of being signed, but uh, we could uh, add more. I mean, particularly I see uh, the AIB, which is uh, most of the Western country are in it, and also uh, 
uh, World Bank, ADB, FTB, and, and European Development Banks, and, and all those working together. So, so I think those uh, really have a lot of uh, uh, common uh, objectives. And also China has a signed MOU with Japan on working on third countries, with France uh, working on third countries. It's, it's actually another way to say working in the developing country or working on the Belt and Road uh, project. So there, there's a lot of possibility there. So, so the key is now we need to have some good atmosphere uh, to beef up the, uh, the uh, you know, the cooperative spirit rather than now we are really uh, 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 compared to go low rather than compared to go high. Let's, let's work on some project, uh, some, some, some really economic benefit of, of the people. So, so I think, you know, so things there, if they are already, like uh, you said, they are copied the assignment that China has done. Uh, in a similar plan, and uh, and then certainly there, there's a lot of similarity. They can work together and complementary uh, uh, of different expertise. And China is good on the on the infrastructure construction. Maybe a U.S. company is good at some technology good, uh, stuff, and European is more on the environment and things like that. I'm sure there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, finally, I would like to add. Actually, uh, I, 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 I I want to say that. You know, Belt and Road has gone into the second phase of the 10 years. And I actually propose we can, you know, multilize a bit of Belt and Road and we can get more enlarged the steering committee uh, like uh, Kinshu is in and we could get different country representative or senior statesmen to give more wisdom. You know, President Xi said the Belt and Road should be gently consulted, uh, gently constructed and gently benefit. So we could actually enlarge that. The other proposal I could make is China and the ASEAN has a China ASEAN center in Beijing. China having a secretary general, but I think country have all representative. It's an international organization, original organization in China. So why can't we set up a Belt and Road uh, Center also that we can uh, you know, uh, invite in the Belt and Road countries along the way to participate in this Belt and Road Center. Uh, so that, 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 that can really have a you know, lot of activities and we can have a lot of projects to be proposed and have a lot of, uh, 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 you know, people know better sources of the fundings and, and things like that. So, and also Belt and Road countries can have their opinions as well. So that could be another uh, recommendation. And thirdly is that uh, we could have a secretary for Belt and Road. I mean, you know, that, that, because people often come in to say, where is, the, where is the telephone number for Belt and Road? So we need to actually get more, uh, uh, in, in more, more, uh, participating and more information for that. And, and finally, the Belt and Road has been uh, held in, uh, in, in Beijing every two years. But at, at the one time I was talking to uh, the, the, the Swiss ambassador and said, because why not Belt and Road be held in Geneva or, or somewhere? So, so I think, you know, we could one year in China, one year somewhere in, in, in Saudi Arabia or in Singapore, you know, let's, you know, let's get the Belt and Road more multilized and more globalized. And, uh, and uh, so that can really become a gently consulted, gently built and gently benefit as President Xi emphasized. So, so that's the thing that in the next 10 years, we could do more to, to that, uh, to, to, to benefit that. And, uh, and, uh, and then probably uh, talking about all those debt trap and other things, China could be also part of the Paris Club or become a member of OECD and let's really work together. Uh, uh, there's many things we can do together. I, I, I think Belt and Road will, will Will be uh, gradually become magnetic for all other similar plans, and then we eventually can draw everybody together. All right, thanks. Um, so now we're going to all the practical questions to uh, Professor Wang Yiwei. And um, he's sure there's one more question coming back to you, so we'll ask you to address it later because the person is asking. Given the current political geopolitical environment, is BRI heading towards a dead end? Our GDI, GCI, and GSI will be new versions of the BRI. So, you know, I think that's a very good concluding question for us. Um, Professor Yiwei, you have a lot of really practical questions going your way. Um, perhaps you could address them now. We can't hear you. You have to. Okay, talk. yes. Uh... Firstly, we, uh, how can we do better uh, to send in the BRI message? I think we can learn from AIIB, as I mentioned, uh, lean, green, clean. Uh, it's uh, easy to remember. 
So BRI is, is more like Chinese, you know, Wu Tong, San Gong, whatever. It's a, in Chinese, it's easy to be understand, but it's for foreigners, it's difficult to, uh, uh, but it's uh, because it's more uh, Chinese uh, found the projects. And so it's uh, the message, maybe it's, uh, so we need to uh, multilateralize, uh, as I mentioned, uh, and uh, include the West, and because of the, the media still, you know, the Western dominate uh, narrative. So if the the West are more involved, the participant benefit from the BRI, it's easy to be understood. That's, that's I think basically because the AIB in the UK and many Western countries join, and so that's easy for them to uh, be promoted. The second question about Ukraine war, of course, the BRI uh, is not a, uh, you know, the war is be between uh, Ukraine and the Russia and the NATO. Uh, so. Uh, so that reason China really help uh, stop this war and uh, as soon as possible, uh, because uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, lots of investment in uh, Ukraine. We we lost uh, lots of money as an EPC model, as I mentioned. But after after the uh, ceasefire, maybe uh, BI actually can contribute. Actually, Ukraine want to join uh, 17 plus one before. They also want to join, uh, actually it's a member of the BI because Ukraine actually is very crucial uh, geopolitical uh, access to Black Sea and uh, Euro, Euro Asia continent. And uh, there is called an iron uh, silk road because of the rail uh, to, uh, in, uh, I think, to, for logistic of the coins and uh, uh, all, all these uh, agricultural products. So Ukraine actually traditionally have a good, friend, uh, good relations with China. Third question about common currency of, of BRI. Well, it's a long way to go. Uh, because the BR actually or, or originally we use our foreign reserve is a US dollar. Uh, so Ten years ago, Chinese foreign reserve is uh, more than four trillion US dollars. So we we used to just buy the federal bonds of the United States, and then when the Americans print the US dollars and then shrink our foreign reserve, uh, according to the economists, actually uh, sixty hundred billion US dollars for Chinese economy is, is enough. So majority of the Chinese foreign reserve need to invest. So that read them BRI at the beginning. So it's a US dollar used. Later, when those countries are actually very poor, uh, they need uh, infrastructure building, they don't have technology, they, they, they just uh, maybe uh, ask China to foreign aid or invest. And then China, of course, invests not just in the US dollars, but later in the uh, RMB. And then use this RMB to buy the uh, products from China or capacity, which help the internationalization of RMB. But now uh, swap and all uh, multi uh, third party cooperation in the currency, digital currency projects are still going on. But uh, to have a common currency in the BRI, I don't think uh, the coming future will happen. So no, no any single currency can replace the US dollar. But uh, more uh, financial cooperation uh, have um, plastic of the currency maybe uh, is, com is coming. The number four is about transparency. Uh, there are three reasons why uh, people claim a so-called lack of the transparency. Firstly, for those you are not joined BRI, and then you claim uh, not transparent to you. But why people don't claim uh, AIIB uh, without enough uh, transparency? Because you join, okay? So you need to join and then to share the transparency. And the second, um, because the projects stay on or enterprises and uh, China found a majority. So people don't trust the Chinese government, uh, use so-called democracy, autocracy, whatever. So that's clean. A third reason for the transparency is those countries, they're very worried about the sanctions, not just the US, even India, because all the Indian neighborhoods, they signed MOU with China. So they say uh, they cannot transparent to the India, otherwise India will punish them. So that's that's the reason, unfortunately. So it's not China want to know parents uh, transparent, but uh, those countries they asked. Uh, number five is about a GSI, GDI, or GCI, or those. Uh, I think those uh, also call initiative, but it's different with BRI. BRI is uh, more about uh, economic inf investment, infrastructure building, mutual connectivity. It's about a real economy. Uh, so global uh, security development and civilization initiative is more uh, on uh, the, U uh, the UN SDG. Uh, it's, uh, it's China just an initiative, but it's, uh, it's, it's UN, it's a multilateral. Uh, BRI so far is bilateral, so as I mentioned. Thank you. Um, there's one question about um, China's worsened economic situation and whether China can still 
have the financial power to support BRI? Good question. Uh, so that's the reason we said not just a huge projects, huge infrastructure buildings, even the West Clean, so the debt trap, the Indian Clean, some of that. So now we change the financing model from uh, from from the EPC to maybe PPP or uh, say uh, not huge projects, maybe some small one. The small is beautiful. Uh, it's like uh, we in a Fiji, in uh, in in Rwanda, uh, in uh, uh, New New Hampshire, many other countries, so called Junchao. It's like uh, uh, people can easy to have this technology and then to benefit. Uh, so it's not uh, the built infrastructure anymore. And the other more uh, the Western and the international finance, as I mentioned, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the Gulf, uh, their sovereign funds and uh, Islamic uh, finance there, they want to join. But uh, we need to build the mechanism to uh, guarantee that those uh, new monies can uh, implement it because the still China worry about the sanctions by the US. Okay, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, I try to um, summarize your questions. Um, if I didn't do a good job, please excuse me, but I wanna make sure that all questions are being addressed. Uh, Kishore, you have one last question about the same thing about GDI, GCI, and GSI. Whether do you see them as a newer version of the BRI, and how would you see them uh, functioning in the current political geopolitical environment? And I think the true question is, is BRI heading towards a dead end because of the given current geopolitical environment? So that's Mm. Kishore's question. And after that, we'll give uh, Dashian, our co-host, and also a very knowledgeable person in this area, his final words. So Kishore, please. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the first question was, is the BRR reaching a dead end because of the geopolitical situation? And the answer is obviously no, because, I mean, everybody focuses on one country, Italy, that is leaving. Now, how many countries have signed up for BRI? I don't know what the number is, somewhere between 140 and 160. So if out of 160 countries, one leaves, <laughs> do you focus on that one country? Or do you focus on the 159 who are staying on? Right? And I can guarantee you when they have another meeting in October this year, uh, uh, over 100 countries will come. The world leaders will come. And then when that happens, you know, then you'll find out that actually the, for the rest of the world, it's a no brainer. Here comes China with its advanced technology, its advanced capabilities, providing low cost capital to build infrastructure. Why should you say no? <laughs> I mean, why would you want to look a gift horse in the mouth? And that's why many countries still will sign up for the, the BRI. So I, I see the BRI as a sunrise organization and not a sunset organization in the way that, by, by the way, OECD yeah, is a sunset organization. G7 is a sunset organization. They will disappear. The sands of time will wash them away. I guarantee you of this. But whereas the BRI is a sunrise organization because more and more countries will want to participate uh, in it. Now, I, I think I, I, I'm not an expert on the Global Security Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Civilization Initiative. Uh, I think we have to wait and see. Uh, these are new uh, concepts that have been launched by China. We have to wait and see what flesh is added to the bones uh, of these uh, ventures. Uh, they may be for different reasons. For example, I like the Global Civilization Initiative because there is incredible amount of multi-civilizational misunderstanding in the world today. And the West, of course, the, the West is going through one of the most traumatic moments in its 2,000 years of history because the West has enjoyed exceptional dominance of the world for 200 years. And that Western domination is ending. It was artificial. It was unreal. If the West was smart, it would actually adapt and adjust to this different world by participating in multi-civilizational initiatives. And BRI, by the way, is a multi-civilizational initiative because it brings back the old Silk Road and so on and so forth. And in fact, I also believe that it is in the United States' interest someday 
to reconsider its position and join the BRI. Right now, it's inconceivable. But if you look at a country where whose infrastructure is decaying, the infrastructure of the United States is in very bad shape. Bridges are collapsing, uh, roads are collapsing. And, you know, President Joe Biden said, in the list of the top 25 airports in the world, not one American airport is on the list of top 25 airports in the world. President Joe Biden said this. How do you get a top 25 airport? Join the BRI. <laughs> All right, Dashen, your turn. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, good. I think, first of all, uh, Joanne and I, we're really blessed that we have these world-class people we invited and all agreed to come. They are Tisho, uh, Yi Wei, and Henry. They represent a different uh, faction of Asians today. Kisho is especially interesting to me. A, he is a fellow Singaporean. Uh, he's, a sing he's a Singaporean Singhalis. Am I correct uh, now, uh, Kisho? Cindy, Cindy. Cindy, Cindy. 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 Uh, and his understanding of the world is way above just about everyone else. And maybe because he spent so much time in the United Nations that he was able to absorb these global views in those few years he spent there. And he can see how China evolved while he was at the United Nations. Henry, on the other hand, is truly a remarkable individual, I find, because even when the United States and China are in such a situation where the two nations are probably I use the right phrase, unfriendly to one another, he continues to outreach to them, speak in their language, their sentiment, and what they don't understand about China. And I think in this, in his own way, he has created a fantastic bridge between the United States and China. One which almost doesn't exist at the moment. You can hear these American leaders talking about China, demonstrating clearly they understood nothing about Chinese history, nothing about Chinese ways and means, and nothing about Chinese mindset. Yi Wei, of course, is a economic and political scientist of the highest caliber in the best Chinese university, Renmin University. And today's lecture he gave is a clear representation of some of the minute issues facing China's Belt and Road Initiative. I like to come back to my good friend, Bali <clears throat> uh, Deepak of Jawaharlal Nehru University. Bali Deepak is a very interesting fellow. He is fluent in Chinese. Uh, he studied in Beijing University and Ta National Taiwan University. He married a Chinese girl who graduated from Peking University. And he did something that's unthinkable for his young life. I think he's under 50. For me, anyone under 50 is young, okay? For, for you might think that he's old. He's really young for me, almost in his youth. For 20 years, 
he translated the four books of China. He asked himself in the beginning, he told me so, why do I want to do that? He said, because the Chinese intellectual, cultural architecture was built on the Si Su. How often the you and I on every day uses idiom Chen Yu that came from there. Almost every day. It's on our back. So what uh, uh, Bali said to me is Indians are to understand the Chinese ways and means. They'll have to understand the Si Su. But to ask the Chinese Indians to read Si Su in Chinese, well, that's just, just a little bit too much. So he did the next best thing. He translated all four books into Hindi. He is a great man who did that. And I would like to see in the Belt and Road Initiative that there will be more Chinese scholars learning the language of Hindi or Indian languages for all that matter and translate more Indian literature and Indian writings into Chinese. So the Chinese, the 1.4 billion Chinese can also begin to understand the 1.4 billion Indians. I think as, as Kisho mentioned, often China and India are two of the most important countries for many, many centuries. And only the last couple of years, a couple hundred years, that they were not. And they're now coming back. And one of the coming back is with the Belt and Road Initiative. And so it is critical for the Chinese to have a deeper and more profound ways of understanding India. For Indians, Chinese are not going away. And for Chinese, Indians are not going away. So this is cultural communications that the Belt and Road Initiative has brought back. It brings back transportation, infrastructure, and all that. For example, all of a sudden, we hear more and more about ASEAN, Association for Southeast Asian Nations, the infrastructure transformation. Kishore mentioned already about this poor country called uh, of uh, Laos, now have a high-speed rail faster than any trains in the United States. And, um, and the uh, Jakarta uh, Bandung high speed rail, where we'll be starting, I think, in late August. And of course, the, the East Coast Trail uh, high speed rail. And you know, within the next five to 10 years, I think the entire Southeast Asia will be connected by high speed rail to China. And also I realized that the nearest point between Malaysia and Indonesia, which is at Sumatra, is between Malacca and an island called Sumatra. And that narrow waterway is narrower than the, than the distance between England and France. So it is not impossible for an infrastructure mania to construct a tunnel going from Malaysia into Indonesia. So it is not impossible for us to think within the next five to 10 years, you can buy a train ticket from Beijing all the way to Surabaya, Indonesia. Then the entire East Asia will be connected and all because of the Belt and Road Initiative. 
This is exciting for any human beings on earth to see that people can be connected. Because when you travel by train, you actually see what's happening on the ground. You see the culture change. It's not like flying from Singapore to London. You see absolutely nothing in between, but the beautiful airport of Singapore and the terrible airport of London. And so I think the future, despite of all the naysayers in the world, is really bright for BRI because it is on the premise of helping everyone, including China, by the way, to make better lives for its people. A country that makes better lives for its people is a good country. Never mind about the ideology. That is simply not important. Ideology comes and goes. Better living should be a forever thing. I hope people will think about these issues today. And uh, of course, the uh, whole recording will be distributed worldwide as soon as it is ready. I want to thank my good friend, actually my big brother, K.K. Poa, uh, the, um, the founder of World Scientific. You know, in 1980, K.K. actually asked me, do I want to join the World Scientific? And I said, nah, you must be crazy. Nobody wants to do that. What, what benefit is there? It is now one of the most important publishing houses in the, in the country, in the world. It just shows how, how silly I am. I was and I still am. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I want to people to walk away thinking about all the challenges that was brought up today and how these people like Henry, like Yi Wei, like Kisho, and of course, like Joanne, who spends hours and hours thinking about them and implementing ways to make sure that lives could be better for the people that it can benefit. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Dashi. We'll send one minute back to Shesmin to give us a couple of words, our organizer. Um, so thank you everyone for joining today's event. So we have now overrun our time, but we would like to thank you, our supportive audience for staying with us. We'd also like to thank our special guests, Kishore Mabobani, Dr. Henry Wang, and Professor Yi Wei, as well as our co-moderators for the informative dialogue. Thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.